Welcome Australia. It's that time again for another podcast from the Mate Team, where we try and get into your head with stuff that makes us sound smart. Sit back and relax. It's time for us to be mates. Welcome to a, another edition of the Let's Be Mates podcast. Uh, here again with your team from Mate, uh, Bosco Dom. How are you boys? Yeah, good, good. good day. Yeah. We had some good feedback on last week. So yeah. yeah, it was good. We've had a lot of people listen in and ask us a bunch of questions, which is only going to drive new shows moving forward. So look out for that. Um, but one of the pod, this podcast today um, is the first time we're talking to one of our mates, and we call this podcast "Drinking with Our Mates." And we're not literally going to be drinking, but um, the purpose is is that we've got a special guest on board. Uh, we're a corporate customer of this business as well, but um, this business is also you know, had a, a unique experience in, during this COVID time and, and they have a unique business in general. And um, the business we're talking today to is a, a business called Malt Shovel, which is a beverage business. And I won't get into their details. I'll let our guest um, talk about that. So let's get straight into it. Let me introduce uh, Craig Brown, uh, a.k.a. Brownie, as he's known to the industry um, and, and a good mate of, of the team at Mate as well. Uh, Brownie, are you there? Yes, Mark, I'm here. How are you? Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Let's Be Mates podcast. Thanks for, for your time and for joining us. And um, look, we've got you for the next 20 or so minutes, which is great. And uh, first of all, let's start with who you are, uh, your your role in the business and, and about a bit about the malt shovel business as well. Uh, I'll start about the business and I'll get into, what, I guess, what I do there. But um, Malt Shovel is a – we're actually a subsidiary of Lion. So Lion, people know them as Lion, Nathan. They're the uh, second largest brewer in Australia. But we do operate independently. Um, we sell a wide range of, of beverages in both pack and draft formats. Uh, and we specifically cater to the what we call the record channel or restaurants, cafes, uh, small bars and – as you know, corporate accounts uh, with a focus on craft beer. Uh, my role is a business development executive uh, at Malt Shovel. And I guess it's it's a twofold role in that, that I manage and grow revenue in existing customers and uh, an onboard, sorry, and I onboard new business uh, across the channels I mentioned. So and on top of that, it's to grow the distribution revenue and market share of our own brands like, such as the Malt Shovel XPA. Uh, so, Craig, obviously, um, you know, you guys don't just sell Malt Shovel. Uh, what are some of the brands that our listeners would, would know that you guys sell? So, um, yeah, we've got a, a wide range of beer, as I mentioned before, in Pack and Tap. Uh, the whole line portfolio, but we also have our own beer, the Malt Shovel XPA. Uh, outside of beer, though, we sell uh, a wide selection of Oatly wines, a uh, selection of Vanguard Spirits, which include Four Pillars Gin, which was uh, recently voted the best gin in the world. We, uh, we sell Remedy Kombucha, we sell Chabello Coffee, uh, and there's also been some uh, new product innovation with alcoholic seltzer and ginger beer. So there's this pretty wide gamut of products in the beverage section. And alcoholic seltzer, what do we call it in Australia? Because it's a quite American term, but it's it's huge. It's one of their probably biggest category growing over there, right? Yeah, that's right. Obviously, that's why it's here. We still a lot of trends from the US, and they figure if it's big in the US, it's going to be big here. What is but it? It's, what is it's it exactly? just known as alcoholic seltzer. It's like soda water. Is it so, yeah, pretty ah, much. Flavored soda water. Is that flavored soda water that's alcoholic? Is it supposed to be healthy drinking? Is that what the purpose is? Uh, no comment. No, I don't. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be healthier, but obviously, there's still sugar involved. Yeah. Okay. And, and what would you say are the unique differences between malt shovel and lion with your business? So uh, Malt Shovel is, uh, with Lion, as, as you know from previous uh, work in multinational companies, you're very restricted and there's a lot of process to go through. Where one of our kind of our overarching core principles is freedom to fly at Malt Shovel. So we've, we've got the freedom to do almost anything we want if it's going to uh, provide a good outcome for the business. Uh, so I guess that's probably the main difference in work, working for Lion versus working for Malt Shovel. 
And, you know, I think that's the reason uh, why I think we resonate so well with Craig and his business. I think um, I think the, the point there, he says, freedom to fly, I think uh, we've made, that's literally what we've done, right? By having the opportunity to, to run our own business and, and come up with our own strategies and, and go to market the way we want to go to market, you know, based on the previous roles we've had, has enabled us to fly and, and deliver what we thought was the right way to do it and to actually see it see it happening and and actually working has been a sort of a you know like a, a a big motivation for us and i think that's why i feel like we resonate and that's probably one of the reasons why we've we're doing this with craig today which is great i, th um, I think it also allows you to adapt and you know change very quickly agile yeah. be agile to, to market changes or you know you can throw something out there and give it a try and if it doesn't work you know you learn from that or if it works you, you build on that too yeah and, you know, Craig, if I talk about your role specifically and, you know, what do you see as some of the, uh, I guess, the, the advantages that your business offers compared to your competitors? So I guess um, we're really empowered uh, to improve our knowledge of, uh, of beer as well as the draft quality systems that provide tap beer. So I guess one of the big advantages is we're on hand to uh, help with the service side of, of tap beer as well as selling just, you know, we're not just an outlet to sell beer and move on to the next customer. We try and help them uh, have the best quality draft draft beer. Uh, we troubleshoot any problems they've got uh, and we can kind of do things quickly. Like it's a quick turnaround. Um, a lot of the businesses we look after are small businesses. You now cafes and restaurants uh, aren't multinational companies. They're not rich pubs and clubs with poker machines to kind of uh, fund their food and beverage. They really rely on on alcohol as a main contributor to, to driving margin. So uh, being on hand to help them out when uh, little issues arise uh, is, is a benefit for, uh, that we provide that not many other customers do. Uh, yeah, Craig, so I guess that uh, leads us into a, a good point uh, regarding the current situation with um, with COVID-19 or coronavirus, as, as they call it. So um, I'm sure your business um, has had some challenges. So, um, you know, what are some of the challenges or opportunities you've seen in the last three months or so uh, during COVID and, and how have you your business adapted to those? And, and maybe talk about the, like, the experience in the industry today. Like maybe even if it's not with you directly, but what have you seen as some of the trends in the industry during COVID? Obviously, apart from people closing down, all right, because, yep. you know, we can't do that. But what are the, I know, yeah. is, there, is there trends around opportunities? Is there, I know one of your competitors that you you love to hate, Young Henry's, right, um, switched, I saw a story of them switching to hand sanitizer, and, and I, I know Malt Shovel hasn't done that, but I mean, I guess that's a, a unique story out of a bad situation, whether whether that was successful or not. Or, and I know Young Henry's is a swear word to you boys at uh, Malt Shovel, um, but don't worry, we're, we're furfy drinkers, so we're all right. Um, Good man. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess to touch on that as well, apart from what Ross asked as well. Yeah, so I guess with the COVID, obviously many businesses lost their entire revenue stream overnight. Um, not having on-premise diners or on-premise patrons in bars they basically went from 100% to 0% and it, it happened quickly as we all know. So um, some of them, but not all of them adapted to be takeaway food options. So even if food wasn't their primary kind of uh, business purpose, you, can, you know, small bars aren't primarily food outlets, but many of them uh, switched to takeaway food options. Um, but also many closed up once JobKeeper was announced uh, because it was more financially viable for them to close rather than to open as a takeaway and pay staff, overheads with food, et cetera. So um, one of the good things that came out of the COVID situation was an on-premise liquor license does not allow a venue to sell uh, takeaway liquor. Where um, credit to uh, a comp or organization called Olga, so it's the Office of Liquor Gaming Australia, they were quick to uh, change the laws and adapt so on-premise venues could sell takeaway liquor. Because until then, obviously, no one was selling any liquor. We weren't selling any beer. So uh, it's been a way that they've adapted quite quickly to be relevant, um, selling pizza and, and bimaretti, for instance, or um, you know, selling burgers and beers. So that was probably a, a good takeaway um, for our customers. And there was an, a good opportunity for our customers um, on how they adapted to kind of remain relevant. 
I guess for us, a lot of opportunities come about in the e-commerce space. Um, so we launched an internal marketplace for staff members, which allowed um, us to deliver beer straight to your place of residence. Previously, uh, one of the perks of being uh, an employee of Lion or Malt Shovel is that we have uh, the ability to go to our bottle shop um, internally and buy beer at, at either a reduced rate and you can use your kind of points towards purchasing beer. Well, obviously, all our sites are closed at the moment uh, unless you're a brewer to kind of um, maintain health standards. So, yeah, we come about with the uh, marketplace. So all of our staff members can order beer to their home using their points or paying by credit card. So that's never been done before. It's New South Wales and Victoria at the moment. We're looking to expand that nationally. And that may eventually go out to family and friends as well. So that's kind of one e-commerce thing that's come out of... Uh, as an opportunity that's come out of the COVID situation. You know, um, and, uh, a couple of things that uh, Craig mentioned there, which I think uh, are relevant to our to our industry and our business as well, is that, um, you know, uh, when it, obviously internet and mobile's probably being classified as a essential service. I don't think it officially was, but it, it definitely is, right? Especially in this day and age with everybody working from home and, and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, the, um, uh, with the increased capacity with people working from home, we saw the NBN come out with, you know, 40% increase in the, the CVC, um, which is important. Um, and so I think that, that sort of resonates to the, is it the Olga, you said? The Olga situation? Yeah, OL, OLGA, G, Olga. And, and yeah. so that, that, that licensed body, or, um, that, that, that part of the business, you know, adapted to make sure that businesses still had some sort of a revenue stream in a time where they're, pure revenue or they're, 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 the way they do it every day went, went offline, right, or, or didn't stop working. And, and the other thing as well you mentioned, Craig, yeah, one thing that we're, we're working on at the moment is a loyalty program we've made, right? And so and we, we talk about this uh, whole pro, um, concept of head, heart, hands mm-hmm. when we deal with our customers and, you know, get into their head with the right information, which means we get into their heart for them to buy into our business and then we get them to do something with their hands, which is buy our product, right? And I think um, a loyalty program is something that we've been developing for a while because we don't want to just chuck any type of loyalty product in the market. We want to try. We want to chuck something out there that's meaningful. And you spoke about the the perks uh, process that your business had, which which is really neat. I think loyalty and those type of perks things uh, really go a long way and probably even worth more value in times of crisis, especially during the COVID period. And I think uh, that's really good that that your business and the and your industry did that, which is awesome. As an industry, though, Craig, did you know you're obviously taking away pubs and clubs and, and and restaurants to a degree but overall consumption wise and purchasing wise did was there a big drop off overall uh mate the in march we as a total business so total line business was up in march and that was mainly it was all down to the um panic buying you know the, the kind of the panic buying with uh people lining up the door at dan murphy's to, to stock up on beer but obviously that was short lived like any kind of panic buying and the decline in tap has, uh, sorry, I'll put it the other way, the increase in packaged beer through retail hasn't made up for the decline in tap, which until you know last Friday was zero litres. And another point that Craig made before around panic buying and things like that, I think, you know, everybody spoke, the, the, the thing that hits the, the news is about toilet paper panic buying, right? And I think for two months we probably saw panic buying with internet as well, right? Yeah, it and wasn't just it wasn't just toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was a, 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 any essential service. So yeah, we saw. A, I mean, pre pre lockdown, probably same as Craig. We we saw there was a huge increase in people panicking, saying, "Oh, you know, what if I'm stuck yeah. for, at home for two months or three months? I need internet." Um, we had customers come to us who who'd only who'd never had MBN before or fixed line broadband service. They only ever had mobile broadband or their their phone hotspot. Um, and then they're coming and signing up just in case they do need it. Um, so yeah, so it probably resonates with us as well. Oh, absolutely. I think it was uh, it was sort of funny to see. I mean, obviously it was it was delivered by default because of uh, the current situation. But it was, I know all we heard about was toilet paper. But I think in mo- most industries there was some sort of panic buy. You know, I, I definitely went and, and panic buy on beer. That's the one thing you do, right? I mean, toilet paper, I say just jump in the shower if you need to, right? Uh, I know. Anyway, that's my point. Um, I think it all come about when the Prime Minister kind of first announced that we could be in this situation for six months. 
and people hear six months like oh that's half the year so if i can't go to the shops or i can't get what i need i'm going to stock up on you know stuff that i'm going to need to get through this and uh beer was one thing toilet paper was another and obviously if everyone's stuck at home instead of office spaces then they needed to kind of uh get a better internet connection or speed up their internet, get more data, whatever it might be, is probably why you guys saw such an uplift. You know, one question, uh, and there's something I ask myself in this business and we talk about, there was obviously trends and things happening before COVID, then everything went out the window during COVID and people are wondering if it's going to be the same, is it going to go back to normal pre before you know, pre-COVID, back when COVID finishes, or is, it going to, is, is COVID going to be the new normal? Um, I, I mean, I know it's hard to predict or, t- or hard to to know what's going to happen, but, I mean, if you had to have a gut feel for it, well, what would you think in your, in your so industry, that is? Yeah, you're right. So pre-COVID, uh, there was, and there has been for quite a few years, a trend towards premium and craft beer in Australia. Um, the size of the market share craft beer has in Australia is, is nowhere near what it is in the US, and obviously we steal a lot of trends from the US. So um, we're heading towards that number. There was a big craft movement. Uh, with the lockdown and the panic buying, it, it all kind of went back out the window and people were buying the brands that, they've, that have been around for decades and they know to his new 4X Gold. They were the ones that kind of saw the big uplift. Obviously, there's a value proposition and uh, people were kind of pinching every penny, to use the term. So um, there's been a slight downshift in craft beer but that's already started to come back with the on-premise trade kind of slowly reopening. Uh, will it return to normal? I think it will, but it might be a little bit longer than we thought. Uh, and I think by 2021, craft beer will definitely be in, in growth again. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Um, actually, you know, one thing we didn't ask Craig before we, we uh, asked him to come on the show. I mean, is he a mate customer? Should we really be talking to somebody that's not a mate customer? Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We should, uh, you need to sort some uh, third party uh, suppliers out, then I'll jump on board. <laughs> well, that's a very um, sophisticated response. Thanks, Craig. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Craig, one thing um, we, you know, life's starting to come back to normal to a degree. I guess some places are starting to open. You can have sort of 10 people in a cafe or restaurant now. We, you know, we bought pizza from our local Italian restaurant on Saturday night, but obviously some people were quite inventive and. Um, adaptive to the to the COVID situation, you know, had the pasta shop selling flour and, um, you know, people putting together meal kits to take home and cook at home. Do you think, do you see any of your customers that are, you know, think did a good job of that and then will potentially continue that as a new revenue stream? Yeah, we obviously had a wide spectrum. Some were great at it, some weren't so good. But um, I, I guess I look after the ACT as well and the customers in the ACT, uh, that I might were the, the best to respond. Um, I think because the licensing regulations down there are a little bit different to New South Wales um, in that they were always allowed to sell package beer uh, as a takeaway option. And if they had in-house delivery, they could also deliver um, package liquor. So those guys were pretty proactive with kind of getting in touch with us and, and getting on like uh, meal deals or just selling six packs straight from their fridge. So just trying to kind of offset the loss of, of what they would sell on premise uh, as a takeaway. But yeah, those customers were definitely better at it than, than the rest. I think just because they had experience in doing so. Yeah. And um, uh, what are people drinking these days, Craig? So, you know, what are people buying? What's What trends are you seeing in terms of specific um, products and brands and things like that? So still in Australia, the highest sellers are still the mainstream uh, mainstream lager styles, like I mentioned before, two is new, four is gold, VB for one of our competitors. Um, but in the in the craft section, it, it changes so rapidly and so frequently. Um, pale ale, I guess, is still the number one craft style in Australia. Uh, when you think pale ale, you think like James Squire, 150 lashes. Um, but there's there's new well they're not new uh styles but there's new uh popularity in styles coming up all the time um sour sour beers are, are getting really popular once again trends from the us um as i mentioned before ginger beer uh used to be a kind of an old person's drink for for yeah. one of a better term but it's become really popular again and james squire have just launched ginger beer um and then you also ipas are always kind of in and out of popularity um, 
but really it's any kind of any craft beer that's very hop driven or very hazy uh is, is quite popular at the moment it reminds me of um remember warheads i mean I, I guess you have to be born in the 80s to sort of know what that is right but what, what you know mentioned before sour and all those different brands and the, as warheads sort of change lollies to be about an experience versus what it tasted like if that makes sense so interesting uh, it's funny because i remember like back when my dad used to buy beer here. He always just there was always VB or yeah, Tui's yeah. new or you know the little stubbies. But you go to Dan Murphy's now or a bottle shop, and there's like how many how many beers are there? I mean, it's like uh, it's mate, crazy. literally thousands. And yeah. I mean, craft brewers. You don't even have to talk about beers. There's a there's a new craft brewer every day, pretty much opening yeah. up. Um, there's probably four to five hundred independent craft brewers in Australia right now, uh, and there's more and more coming on board because they see that. Um, yeah, it's a growing trend towards that craft beer. A, cra- a craft beer drinker is more likely to switch than be loyal, though. though. Are they going to try, you know, five or six different brands throughout the year or types throughout the year as opposed to, you know, the Tui's new drinker that just bought Tui's for 30, 40 years? 100%. They've got what we call a larger repertoire of beers, and they're not so much loyal to a brand, but they might be loyal to a style. So IPA drinkers like to drink IPA, pale ale drinkers like to drink pale ale and might venture out a little bit, but um, they'll definitely kind of cross brewers, cross styles, uh, seasonal releases are big for the craft brewers. So um, we, we do quite a few out throughout the year in both pack and tap format, and it might be 100 kegs uh, for the nation. And we brew 100 kegs, and once it's sold, it's sold. And there's ones that, that recur every year that kind of have a, a, quite a following. So recently over Easter, we uh, under the White Rabbit Brewery, we released a uh, chocolate stout. Um, and I think there was a third or fourth year that we've done it. And it's, it's got that popularity that's pretty much pre-sold before we even make it uh, because kind of people are after it because they, they drank it last year and really enjoyed it. It's funny, right? I think uh, every industry has the same sort of challenges with consumer behaviour. You know, Craig uh, or Brownie, I should say, um, at Malt Shop, I spoke about, you know, not being loyal to a product, new, you know, people who are a, a, a craft brewer, fans will will tend to switch and try and different things but i guess you're always thinking about how to keep the consumer in your world right uh and buying your product and i think that relates to every single industry and i think uh just it's uh, my opinion it's always you it's always good to look at what other businesses and other industries are doing to keep their customers because i think something unique is what's going to set you apart from the rest in the industry that you play in um yeah that's my point of view Take it or leave it, I guess, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave um, it, thanks. Well, look, mate, uh, Brownie, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for being on the show. Um, it was great to hear uh, your story as well as the, the malt shovel uh, business story as well. And, um, look, we're a, we're a corporate customer of malt shovel. We probably should buy a bit more to give Craig a bit more, um, you know, bonuses on his end. But uh, but we you know we do we do invest in some way, shape, or form. But um, Craig, if people want to become a corporate customer or a customer of Malt Shovel, how can they do that? Uh, you're going to just Google search Malt Shovel Brewery or smaltshovel.com.au is the website. All right, Pretty awesome. Easy. Awesome. And if you're in the, the ACT or Sydney, you'll probably get Craig. Uh, make sure you say hello and uh, reference mate as the as the referring partner. All right, Brownie, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for your time um, and have a great day. Thanks, guys. Cheers. See you, see you, mate. See ya. All right, boys. I think that was a was a really good um, session. I think uh, that offers gives us a lot to think about, and hopefully our viewers as well. Um, that's another. It's the end of another show for us. Uh, any more comments from you guys? Oh, thirsty now. We might yeah. have to. Grab, grab a couple of say, like a we, we do have a few furfies in the in the fridge ready to go. That's something that I do in this business to to support my staff and the team. Uh, <laughs> they're all laughing if you can't hear them or see them. Um, but look, thanks Australia for joining us. Uh, see, see you, you soon, soon, mate. Thanks for listening to the Let's Be Mates podcast by the team at Mate. Search for the Let's Be Mates podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and at letsbemates.com.au. Hit subscribe to get the latest episode each week. For all your talco needs, choose a provider you can trust like a mate. Visit letsbemates.com.au, Google Mate, or call us on 13 14 13 to sign up today.